Sorry, we're having some little issues. Stupid thing. Okay, uh, so you guys can see that okay, right? Um, <clears throat> all right. So let's get going. Um, so today's, the plan for today is to discuss, uh, continue our discussion of fine structure, and uh, the new thing will be the Zeeman effect. All right? And so um, you guys can hear me okay? Everything's good? Everything's good. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right, so, um, so last time, let's just remember what the heck we were talking about last time. Last time what we were talking about is um, <clears throat> when we have a spin orbit correction. And so for a hydrogen atom, then we had uh, the new Hamiltonian is equal to the old unperturbed Hamiltonian plus H prime, which is some, um, uh, which is the spin orbit. And uh, we figured out that H prime is equal to um, F of R, some function of R times L dot S, where F of R, we, we calculated that, we know what that is. It's some, some function E squared over eight pi epsilon naught times one over M squared C squared times uh, one over R cubed. <clears throat> so we did all that, um, and um, we then try to find a good basis. What's a good basis? And we looked at our old basis, which was psi n l m sub l m sub s, which was indexed by l squared l z s z. And so then we put those guys into a commutator with L, um, with H prime, and we saw that it did not equal zero. <clears throat> and so then this that means that the old basis is a bad basis. <clears throat> and so we considered a new basis. We, we guessed the basis and we said, what about this? Psi N L uh, J M sub J. And then this one is indexed by L squared um, J squared J Z. <clears throat> and so then we looked at the commutators of H prime with those guys, L squared, um, H prime, J squared, H prime, J, Z, using our new commutator trick, and we saw that they were equal to zero. And so therefore, it's a good basis. And L, J, M sub J is a good basis. Yay, we're so happy, we've got a good basis. And so that means then uh, that delta E, <clears throat> the correction due to spin orbit, SO is spin orbit, for the nth state, uh, we can just calculate it using our new good basis. And so we can just look at every state indexed by the good basis in the good basis and find out the energy correction, psi n l j m j. Um, we put our h prime in there, which is f of r, l dot s, and we just calculate it. 
and that's our energy correction due to due to spin orbit coupling. Uh, and so we got to calculate that thing, and so that's what we were doing last time. Um, and so we can just do the broquette trick. We can see that our basis states look like this. That's what these states look like, and we got our little f our h prime l dot s. Um, and so we just plug them in. <clears throat> and then we can just calculate that. And so then we then we use the the what we call the spin orbit trick. Spin orbit trick that everybody knows and loves, our little spin orbit trick. This is you guys might not be familiar with it, but now you should become familiar with it. Because professors love to put this one on the test. Uh, J squared is equal to L squared plus S squared plus two L dot S. And so then you see that L dot S is equal to one half uh, J squared minus L squared minus S squared. And so then when we calculate our delta E, we just plug that sucker in there. And then we have delta E uh, is equal to uh, we can sort of move things around, R and L. We have all the radial parts here, here. <clears throat> and then we have the, uh, uh, and then we have the, uh, the angular parts here. Uh, one half J squared minus L squared minus S squared. Uh, J, MJ. And this then becomes, this part becomes, super easy, it used to be super hard, now it becomes super easy, um, and we see that we have, um, that the delta E is now, we have still the radial part, but now this angular part becomes super easy because we see that these guys are eigenstates of these operators, so I can just plug them in and I get uh, one half times h bar squared j times j plus one minus h bar squared l times l plus one minus h bar squared uh, s times s plus one. Right, because that's what these guys are equal to. Um, and so that's, that's uh, almost the answer. So we're almost done, but then we have to calculate this thing And that one's like um, a little um, harder, but you can still calculate it using these virial theorem tricks. And it's actually a homework problem in Griffiths. And so we can write it as a, um, if you go through the work, then you see that this term is equal to e squared over eight pi epsilon naught times one over m squared c squared times uh, one over um, l times l plus one half uh, times l plus one times n cubed times a naught cubed, uh, where a naught uh, is equal to the Bohr radius. Some, it's a, a collection of physical constants. Um, okay, so then um, when you, and so when you put it all together, then you put it all together and you get delta E spin orbit is equal to um, a lot of formulas here, but just kind of grind through it times one over m squared c squared. Um, one half h bar squared times j times j plus one uh, minus l times l plus one minus s times s plus one. Uh, well, we always, uh, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, times divided by um, l times l plus one half uh, l plus one times n cubed, a naught cubed. Okay, 
uh, but then, so you, so you, so that's the answer. That's the spin orbit correction. That's the correction due to the spin orbit coupling. But then there's a cute little thing to notice, which is not obvious at all. But the fine structure, when we we define the fine structure correction as um, delta E, the energy correction, the fine structure is equal to the relativistic correction plus the spin orbit correction. And when we and and when we add those two corrections, there's some cancellation. And there's and it turns out that there's no because you, you see that this guy depends on um, depends on L and J. But when you add those two, there's the the L dependence drops away, which is not obvious at all. I mean, it's not obvious that that would happen, but it's kind of a beautiful little thing. And I'm sure there's some deep physical principle why it happens, but I don't really know. <laughs> I don't know what that physical principle is. Uh, maybe you will figure it out. It must be there. Um, I just don't know what it is, but but then in the bot the bottom line is that the the formula after some after some algebra after a little bit of algebra that you guys could actually do, um, then you see that the energy correction uh, is the fine structure energy correction depends on n and j, and it's equal to negative thirteen point six eV over uh, n squared times um, 1 plus, um, well, actually, let me, let me do it like this. This is the energy correction. I'm sorry, let me, let me write it correctly, uh, times, oops. times um, alpha squared over um, n squared uh, times n over j plus one half minus three quarters. Okay, so that's the, that's the energy correction. And here alpha is equal to, um, E squared over four pi epsilon naught h bar c. Does anybody know what alpha is equal to? <laughs> Does that look familiar to anybody? Is it one over one thirty seven? Yeah, that's exactly right. One over one thirty seven, which we, which we fondly fondly call what? What do we call it? The fine structure constant. Yeah. Now you know where the fine structure constant comes from. Fine structure constant. What a funny little coincidence. We're calculating the fine structure and we got the fine structure constant. Oh, that's where it comes from. That's why we call it the fine structure constant because it comes out when we're doing the perturbation theory of the fine structure. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> we see that the fine structure splits some states. There's degeneracy. And so what states does it split? It splits the what states, the blank states. Which states does it split? Somebody tell me. There used to be degeneracy in a particular quantum number, and now there is no longer that degeneracy. The fine structure correction split. That's how I do. This is a, these are four degenerate states, my fingers, and then I go, whoop, now they're split. Degenerate, split. Which states got split by this uh, correction? Can somebody tell me? Uh, the states with different total angular momentum. That's exactly right. The J states. 
And you can see it because in here, there's a J. And so that means that delta E depends on J. And so it splits the J states. The J states get split. And so that's, that's the ones that get split. <clears throat> and so let's just do an example. So suppose that I have um, N equals three. And I say, what happens to the N equals three manifold in the, in the hydrogen atom? So I'm talking about these states. You know, this is the hydrogen atom, the nucleus. This is the ground state. Uh, N equals one, the second state, N equals two, and the third state, N equals three. And so there's the degeneracy is two N squared degeneracy, right? And so how do all those states get split in the N equals three? So how do they get split by the fine structure? So what we do is we look at the N equals three and we say, okay, well, N equals three can give us, um, it's, there's a bunch of degeneracy um, and the degeneracy is in the L equals, what are the possible L's for N equals three? Somebody tell me. Zero and two. Uh, say it one more time, please. Zero, Zero, one, and two. That's exactly right. Those are the L's that live inside of the N equals three. And now we, we add S equals one half. And so that gives us then J equals, um, actually, let's do it. Let me write it here. Um, we add S equals one half, add, and so that means then that J is equal to, so what happens when I add uh, S equals one half to zero? What, what, uh, what J's do I get? Just one half. Exactly. And what happens when I add S equals one half to one? What do I get? Both one half and three over two. Exactly. I get one half and three halves. And what happens when I add one half to two? You get three halves and five halves. That's right. I get three halves and five halves. So those are all the, the different J's. And you might be confused by the fact that there's two uh, S equals one halves and two uh, three halves, but that should not be confusing really at all because that just means that those are total J states, but they have different L's because this one half came from L equals zero, whereas this one half came from L equals one. And this J equals three halves came from uh, L equals one, and this one came from L equals two. So don't, you shouldn't be confused by that. Uh, and so we can see then that the total J's are uh, J equals um, one half, three halves, and five halves. And there's more than J, there's more than one J equals one half, but it doesn't matter because they both have the same J, they have the same energy. And so these are the different possible J's. And so these then split. Now, if I look at this uh, energy correction, I see that the energy correction the fine structure energy correction is negative. I'm circling it right there. It's negative. Uh, there's a negative number there. And so, and so the fine structure correction, the splitting, it's going to go down. The, the levels are going to go down. So these states are all degenerate. So there's great degeneracy here. But now the fine structure is going to split it. So right now we have all of these n equals three states are 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 sitting here in this manifold, and there's it's highly degenerate. But now it's going to split. How many levels will it split into? Somebody tell me. How many levels? Three levels. Right, because there's three j's, and the splitting depends on j. So that means it'll split into three levels. So I'll draw it like this, boom, 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 
boom, three levels. And so the lowest one, if you look at the formula, since there's an inverse, inverse there, it's going to be the lowest one will be, well, can someone tell me what the lowest one is? Can someone tell me? What? J equals five halves. Well, it's five inverse. Over. It's inverse. So it's going to be, it's when you put a smaller J there, you're going to get a bigger negative number. So if you just look at the formula, it'll and mess with it. You'll see that actually this one is J one half uh, because of the sign and all that. And then J, and this one is J three halves. And this one is J five halves. Okay, so you just, and so that's that's the structure. And so if you use the, the proper notation, then people call this uh, uh, delta E and then three slash comma five halves because this, this number is the uh, N and this number is the J. And so then this, this splitting here, you would call Delta E. And this is what uh, atomic physicists really care about this stuff, you know, because they measure all this stuff. And then this one would be uh, the Delta E, um, N equals three and J equals one half. So those are the splittings of those levels. Okay, um, and there's and there's still, and these levels are, and so I'll ask you a question: Are these levels here degenerate? Yes or no? Is there still degeneracy in those levels, even when I take into account the the, the fine structure? Are they degenerate? Yes or no? Somebody tell me. Yeah. Yeah, still highly degenerate. Highly degenerate. And what are they degenerate in? What what quantum numbers are they degenerate in? Somebody tell me. In J. Say it again. In J, because you have states with different L's having the same J. Yeah, but what are the but if I pick this this one right here, for example, is J equals one half. So that's the J is fixed. And so, but that is a degenerate manifold. This level is degenerate in what quantum numbers? Somebody tell me. In J. Well, J is fixed. So it's, so you see what I'm saying? It's, it's not degenerate in J because the J states got split. You see what I'm saying? Because this J is different from this J, you know, all the different J states are split in energy. So let's pick one particular J state. Oops, screw that up. I meant like the M corresponding to like J. The, yeah, the what? Are they, are they degenerate in JZ? Yes, and what is that quantum number called? That's MJ. the operator. MJ? Yes, exactly. Perfect. It's degenerate in MJ, yes. What else is it degenerate in? There's another one, there's another quantum number too. I'll give L. you a yes, because of this up here, right? The L's, it's degenerate in the L's because for one of those levels, there's multiple L's. So it's degenerate in MJ and L. So it's still degenerate. Good, all right, that's fine structure. Yay, we did fine structure. <laughs> Great accomplishment. Okay, so now let's keep going. <clears throat> so now it's time for the so that's it for fine structure. So now it's time for the next perturbation. And the next perturbation is going to be, let's turn on a, can you guess? We're going to turn on a what? Magnetic field. Exactly. Let's turn on a B field. And uh, this is called the Zeeman effect, and it's it's pretty simple. I want you just to see it's it's a very physical thing, you know, because what you do is it's it's you know you can just imagine these old guys, you know, these old timers way back in a, you know more than a hundred years ago, you know they uh, they could take a piece of wire, and they and they and they twisted the wire into a loop, a solenoid, and then they had batteries back then, and they stuck it into a stuck a battery on it. And so that makes the current flow, right? And so, you know, the current, 
is flowing. And so that creates a magnetic field. And so, you know, so now inside of the solenoid, there's a, there's a big magnetic field. And I'll call this the Z direction. And so this is a, a, a B field. B equals B not Z hat. Okay, so the, so the old timers could do that. And it, you know, it's not a big deal. And then you take uh, a glass jar and you fill it with hydrogen. So now we have a glass jar. And we put a cork in it. And it's filled with hydrogen, right? And then they could do optical spectroscopy on it. They could shine light on it. H bar omega, and they could see, you know, and then they have a detector and they could see what, what light, what, what happens to the light that goes through that hydrogen. And so that's hydrogen. And so these are experiments that the old timers could do more than a hundred years ago to see what, what light gets absorbed what gets absorbed and they notice weird things you know they notice that certain light got absorbed and so they're like oh my god you know what's going on and then they, they hear they had a knob and they could tune this so they could tune the strength of the magnetic field and they notice all kinds of weird stuff happening they would turn that knob and they noticed that the absorption would shift around in really weird ways and it freaked them out it freaked them out so much that they invented quantum mechanics right because they're really so freaked out that they had to invent something and they invented quantum mechanics and so that's what they did and but i just want you to understand that this is the uh this was really the process that occurred you know they, they actually did this and so the zeeman effect is very important uh and so this is a power supply power supply and so they can they can sweep that knob and they notice that you know, when they, they, they have their knob, right? Like um, it's a knob on the power supply, you know? And so they have all the different settings on the power supply, you know, from one to 10, right? And then when that knob was way to the left, uh, then the, the magnetic field um, was, was weak. And so then when the knob is here, we call that the weak. Uh, field uh, Zeeman effect, but when the knob is here on the right, the field is strong. And so when those old timers turned the knob all to the right, way to the right, they saw they saw when the knob was all the way to the left, they saw one behavior. Then they turned the knob all the way to the right. Now the field is strong, and they saw a different behavior. What do you think they called that one? This one is called weak field. And now when the knob is all the way to the right, what do you think they called that effect? Strong field. That's right. They saw a completely different behavior and they call it strong field. Zeeman. And this is, and they did this without even knowing quantum mechanics. They just noticed it. They were just like, oh my God, look at this weird stuff that happens when the knob is to the left. Then they turn the knob all the way to the right. So it's a totally different thing happening. They call it, they say, that's the strong field effect. Then they notice that when the knob is in the middle and the field has an intermediate strength, they notice an even different thing happening. And what do you think they call that? Intermediate field. Yes, they call it the intermediate field Zeeman effect. Intermediate field Zeeman effect. And so they could not you know, they, they could not uh, explain this effect because they did not have quantum mechanics. But later, uh, but as, as a result, they had to invent quantum mechanics. And then once they invented it, they were able to explain this phenomenon very nicely. And so now we will <laughs> do the, we will now do the explanation of this phenomenon. <clears throat> so how do we, so now let's use quantum mechanics to explain what happens. And this is what they couldn't do. So they discovered it and didn't know couldn't explain it, but then later uh, it could be explained. So let's explain it using quantum mechanics. And so using quantum mechanics, we know that hydrogen has a, is explained by, is described by hum Hamiltonian. Uh, and that Hamiltonian is H naught. Now, when I turn on a magnetic field, that's gonna create a perturbation, H prime. Uh, and that will be the Zeeman effect. 
Well, but the question is, what is that H prime? What is the perturbation that's created by the Zeeman effect? Well, to figure that out, we have to use classical mechanics. We always go back to classical mechanics to, to derive Hamiltonians. Classical mechanics is embedded in the structure of quantum mechanics. So to find the Hamiltonian, we use classical mechanics. We find the new Hamiltonian, and then we, and then we turn the variables into operators. That's you know, what you learned last semester. So now I'm going to ask you a question, and the question is, what is the new Hamiltonian? What is the classical Hamiltonian that uh, we need to now take into account that is going to explain this effect? Somebody tell me. Uh, the negative magnetic dipole moment dotted with the magnetic field. That's exactly right. Because the electron has a dipole moment. And the, and the energy of a dipole in a magnetic field is, is negative mu, mu dot b. So that's the energy. And it's the classical energy. Classical energy of a dipole, a magnetic dipole, in a magnetic field. And that's a classical result. And so that's our Hamiltonian, because that's the energy. That's where the energy is coming from. Uh, OK. So now we have to figure out uh, what, now we got to figure out what that is. So we see that H prime is equal to negative mu E dot B. But what the heck is mu E? What's the dipole moment of an electron? Ha <laughs> ha, what is it? Uh, what does it come from? Well, let's remember that dipole moments, dipole moments come from spinning charge. Spinning charge. Or I should say looping. When charge is flowing in a loop, it's, it, it gives you a dipole moment. And so an electron is doing this. Here's an electron. It's spinning around the nucleus, right? So that's one spinning motion, but then the electron, let me draw it differently. The electron I think of as like a little planet. And so the electron is spinning around the nucleus, but then the electron also is like a little planet spinning around its own axis. So it's like a sphere, this is the way to think of it, it's like a sphere of charge. And it's spinning around the, the nucleus, nucleus, but it's also spinning on its axis. And so the, um, and so the, the and so the, uh, when it's, spin, and so what is, how do we quantify the spinning around the axis part? That would just be the orbital angular momentum. Yes, spin about axis gives it, orbital angular momentum, but it's also spinning about uh, its own axis, spinning about, I'll just say self. And what, and what, uh, how do we quantify that? Spin? Exactly. That's exactly right. So there's two types of angular momentum, planet, and then it's like, you know, about it's, it's like going around the sun and then going around the axis. Yeah, do you have a question? Yeah, so just a question about that though. I, I've seen like multiple statements about how spin isn't actually referring to the electron spin. Is it just like? That's exactly right. And, and I also mentioned that in some previous lecture also. And the thing is, when you talk about spin, Spin is a really weird concept. It's really sort of tricky to, to understand it correctly, but let's just write something down. Spin is equal to intrinsic angular momentum. Okay. So a particle has intrinsic angular momentum, and, and you might say to yourself, what the hell does that mean to have intrinsic angular momentum? Because a particle is just a little dot. 
that particle is a little dot, right? It's just a dot. And you might say, how can a little tiny uh, dot have angular momentum? Because angular momentum is when things spin, right? Spinning. Uh, but a dot, a point particle, is, can't be spinning. A point particles don't spin because they're point particles. So the idea of them spinning is totally stupid and makes no sense uh, and is incorrect. And so instead, they have an intrinsic angular momentum. But the problem is that our simple minds cannot wrap, we cannot wrap our minds around that concept of a point particle having an intrinsic angular momentum. And the only way to understand it is to use the Dirac equation. So a particle has intrinsic angular momentum. That comes from the Dirac equation. But because we're undergraduates, we cannot understand the Dirac equation. And so the concept of a point particle having intrinsic angular momentum makes no goddamn sense at all. So what we do is we just do a little fake. We do a cheat and we say, well, let's, in our mind, let's picture that the point particle is spread out in space, like, char like a cloud of charge and is spinning about the axis. And if you picture that in your mind, then that is a very beautiful and intuitive explanation that mostly gets it correct, okay? So that's an easy way to remember spin and to put it into a mental framework in your brain. I find it very helpful because otherwise you're just like, what does it mean, you know? But it, it's, even though the point particle is not spread out, it behaves as though it is, okay? So, the, so a nice way to, to, to think of spin is that if the particle uh, is spread out in space and is, is uh, spinning on an axis. And in some sense, that actually is kind of correct because, you know, when you look at all the details of, spin and so in terms of the Dirac equation, you see that there's like a wave function and the wave function has like a, a, a circular flow to it, which leads to spin, but we won't get into all those details. You guys can learn that when you go, go to graduate school. Uh, okay, so, but, the, but the, it's very useful to think of a charged particle as spread out in space and just spinning on its axis. And the reason I say that is because the dipole moment leads to magnetic moment. And, you know, if, uh, and, and when charge is flowing in a circle, it's really easy to understand um, where the magnetic moment comes from because it's a current loop. And so if I, if I have two, the, the angular momentum is, I have a orbital angular momentum and a spin angular momentum. And so the magnetic moment that comes from the orbital angular momentum is really easy to understand because it's just the electron spinning like a loop, a loop of current. And we know what that angle, we know the momentum, uh, the, we know the, the magnetic dipole of a current loop. It's just going to be equal to uh, I times A, you know, the current. And this is a little formula that you all know. The current times the area of the loop. That's the formula or magnetic dipole of a loop. You all learned that formula. You might not remember it today, but I know that you all learned this formula at some point in your past. And so if you calculate that little formula and go through a few steps of algebra, then you'll see that the magnetic moment is equal to Q, uh, the charge over 2M <clears throat> times L. Okay, that's the, uh, the, the charge of the electron divided by twice the mass uh, uh, times L the orbital angle momentum. So that is the magnetic, that is the uh, magnetic dipole due to L and that makes intuitive sense. But now, well, but now it turns out that there's also a, mag, uh, a magnetic dipole that comes about from spin. Because when a charged particle has spin, it also has a magnetic dipole that arises from the spin. And there's a formula for that. And that formula is, the same goddamn formula. It's Q over 2M times S. It's the same formula, except because spin is this weird relativistic quantum mechanics thing, there's a fudge factor. And the fudge factor is what? Someone tell me. It was like two. Yeah, but we call it a, it's the what factor. That's right. The G factor. The G factor. The G factor. And so this is the formula for this, the, the uh, magnetic dipole moment of a charged particle with spin. 
And when you look at this formula, you, you're thinking to yourself, how the hell does intrinsic angular momentum of a point particle create a magnetic dipole? It makes no goddamn sense. But if instead you think to yourself, oh, the charge is spread out like a sphere and it's spinning on its axis, then it kind of makes sense because you can picture the charge rotating and then you expect a magnetic dipole. Do you see what I'm saying? That's why that picture is so useful. It just helps you put all everything into a very simple conceptual framework. Even though the framework is wrong, it gives you the right answer. And so I'm just telling you, it's a trick, you know, it's a, a memory trick, a mnemonic trick. So let's uh, remember that. Uh, and that's why I really like this sphere of charge picture. Oops. I really like this sphere of charge picture. Uh, because it helps you get the physics right. Uh, it helps you put it all together. Okay, and so then we see that uh, for an electron, then G equals two, and we have the magnetic dipole moment is equal to, uh, well here, the orbital one is equal to minus E over two M L, and the spin one is equal to uh, minus E over M. Yes. Okay. And so we see then that the total dipole moment is just going to be the sum of those two, UL plus US is going to be equal to uh, minus E over 2M L plus minus E over M S, which is equal to minus E over 2M uh, uh, L plus 2S, okay? So that's a pretty simple little formula for us to derive. And so then we see that um, if, if that's the magnetic, the total dipole moment, total magnetic, dipole moment of an electron, then we can get the, uh, the Hamiltonian, the Zeeman Hamiltonian, because now it's gonna be a uh, negative mu dot B uh, and uh, B, we'll, we'll, we'll just put B in the Z direction, right? Now here's our B in the Z direction. And so we'll call that B, we'll call that just B times the Z hat. And so that means it's gonna be equal to negative B um, mu Z, negative B mu Z. Yeah, that's right. And so then the Z component of the uh, dipole moment is gonna be uh, I'll put it all together, it'll be B E over 2M, because I'm just plugging this into it, times what? So I have two factors, something plus something else. What goes here? LZ. That's right. And what goes here? 2SC. Yeah, that's exactly right. So that's it. That's the Zeeman, that's the Zeeman uh, perturbation. So we just derived it. So H prime Zeeman is equal to E B over two M times uh, L Z plus two S Z. And that wasn't too hard. That's the Zeeman perturbation. So now we have to ask ourselves, um, if I take hydrogen, so now what we ask ourselves is, we have the, let's take the nth, level of hydrogen and now we can ask ourselves how does it split due to the Zeeman interaction okay so this is the same question that we asked ourselves for the fine structure we did this already for the relativistic correction we did it for the spin orbit correction and now we're going to do it for the Zeeman correction okay uh, but there's the tr there's a trick, which is that let's go back and we notice that it turns out that the Zeeman correction 
uh, is very different. Let's go back to this picture here. Dep it depends on whether the, the, it's this picture right here. See, that's the, that's the knob right here. Just colored in. That's my knob, knob of my power supply. And the old timers noticed that the Zeman behavior was very different depending on whether the knob was all the way to the left, all the way to the right, or right in the middle. <clears throat> so it turns out that there's three different regimes to the Zeman effect. And solving for the Zeman effect is actually kind of complicated, you know, to do it all correctly. I mean, so what we, what we really should do is we could just say, you know, H equals H naught plus H prime. And to really do it right, we should just diagonalize <coughs> the new Hamiltonian. And so if you want to know what, what are the allowed energy levels when you put a hydrogen in a magnetic field, you just take H prime, this new term that we derived, and you add it to H naught, and you just diagonalize everything. But it turns out that that's kind of tricky, depending on the details. Uh, it's really hard to do. And so, but we're going to do it right now. <clears throat> so let's do it. Uh, and so it turns out that there's three regimes. There's three regimes. Um, there's the, the there's, um, and, and, and they have different degrees of difficulty. Let's do the easiest one first, and then we'll do the second easiest one second, and then we'll do the hardest one third. <clears throat> can anyone guess what is, the, what is the easiest one? I wouldn't expect you to know, but can you take a guess? A weak field? Uh, actually, it turns out that's the second easiest one. Weak field. What do you think is the easiest one? <clears throat> Intermediate? Oh, oh, no. oh, oh, intermediate is always hardest. I just want to say that to you. In physics, the intermediate regimes are always the hardest, okay? That's a trick question because we like it when we can have, like, if something is really weak or really strong, then we can make all kinds of approximations. When something is intermediate, all of our approximations go out the window. So this is a general principle in physics. You will always, this will always be the case. So inter <laughs> sounds like a trick question. Intermediate regimes are always the hardest. I'll put that here, intermediate. Oh my God, that's so hard. Oh, it's the hardest one. So it's the strong field is the easiest. That was a trick question. Uh, okay, so let's do it. And so the strong field, is going to be <clears throat> when the Zeeman effect is really strong, but strong relative to what? W what is it that makes this complicated? Um, I'll tell you here because this H naught, you know, H naught is not just the usual Hamiltonian. Uh, the usual Hamiltonian is the kinetic energy of the electron plus. Um, the potential energy, which is the Coulomb potential, negative e squared over four pi epsilon naught r, but h naught now has some other stuff in it. What else does h naught have? What is in h naught? H prime is the Zeeman effect, but what is h naught? What's living inside of h naught? Somebody tell me. There's kinetic energy. There's the Coulomb attraction of the electron to the proton. What else is there? The fine structure. Exactly, the fine structure, the relativistic correction and the spin orbit. That's right. I'll just call that uh, F dot S, fine structure. But when I say fine structure, you should think relativistic correction plus spin orbit. Okay, so that's what's living in H naught. So H naught is like kind of complicated and so in the strong field, the Zeeman effect is really strong. But what, what is it strong relative to? Can you guess? What is the important energy scale here? Fine structure. Yeah, exactly. H prime, the Zeeman effect is way bigger than the fine structure. Why does that make the problem easy? Can you guess? 
Why does that make everything so simple? Why? Because uh, then you can go back to the uh, original H0, which is just kinetic energy plus the uh, Coulomb effect. That, that's right. That's exactly right. Because that means that we can ignore, I think this is how I'm interpreting what you just said. It means that we can ignore the fine structure, which is what you just essentially said. That's right. Because when we ignore the fine structure, life becomes very simple. Um, this, the, the intermediate field, I'm sorry, the weak field is when um, now the Zeeman effect is really tiny. And it's really tiny relative to what? Also fine structure. Exactly. <laughs> and so now what we do is we just use the, the uh, fine structure uh, eigenstates as our uh, as our basis. So then we just use the fine structure eigenstates uh, as our unperturbed states, H naught, as our unperturbed basis. And then the intermediate regime is this one, where the Zeeman effect is on the same order as the fine structure. And then there's no, no good approximation is, is works, no good approximation. And so that's why it's so hard. Uh, okay, so let's do them uh, one after the other. Let's start with the strong field. Strong field. Okay, so for the strong field, um, we have, um, for the strong field, we will have, uh, we can write down the perturbation, H prime, um, is the, let's remember the Zeeman effect. Okay, that's the Zeeman effect. Um, and so now we will uh, ignore the fine structure. And so we have uh, the unperturbed Hamiltonian is just our old, you know, kinetic energy plus potential energy of the hydrogen atom. And so then we um, <clears throat> want to use perturbation theory, H equals H naught plus H prime. So that's the Zeeman effect. And then using, we want to use perturbation theory. And our, our old friend is this formula for perturbation theory, delta E is equal to unperturbed basis perturbation sandwiched between the unperturbed basis. That's the formula we want to use, right? So, but the question is, we have to ask two questions. Remember, we did this before, ask two questions. What's the first question? What's the first question? We want to use the simple perturbation formula to calculate the what the energy splitting of the Zeeman effect in this um, strong field regime, but what is the uh, what are the two questions that we ask? What's the first question? Degeneracy, like if there is exactly the is the end state degenerate? Is it degenerate? And what's the answer? Is the end state degenerate? Yes or no? Yes. No. Yes. It's massively degenerate. The degeneracy is 2n squared. That's a lot. Okay, it's massively degenerate. So then now what's the next question we have to ask? If it's degenerate, then what? What's a good basis? Yes, exactly. There's different ways to ask that question. Or the off diagonal matrix elements in the degenerate subspace equal to zero. You know, there's different ways to ask that question, but it all boils down to the same question, which is, do we have a good basis? Is it a good basis? Whatever basis we have, or is the basis we're using a good basis? Is it a good basis? So what basis do we have? How many bases do we have? 
So our degenerate state, so we're in the, we're in the N, I call it the N manifold. That means that we're in the, on the nth level, which has a bunch of degeneracy. And how do we index those states? What are the quantum numbers? That's our basis is basically the quantum numbers. And so what, um, so it's psi, n, and then there's got to be three other guys. So what, what bases do we have? What are these three quantum numbers? Which one should we pick? Tell me. Tell me. Well, uh, the first one is always L. But okay. for the second two, we have two choices. We could do J and M sub J, or we could do uh, um, uh, uh, M sub L and M sub S. That's exactly right. Perfect. That's exactly right. We have two choices. So we have figured out two bases. That's right. Um, and so we know that this was the one for the fine structure, right? And this is sort of our original basis. Okay, good. That's perfect. That's exactly right. So which one do we choose? Which one do we choose? The, the original basis, because our okay. perturbation has like LZ and SC. Good. Let's do it. Let's try the original one. And this, this is just, it's sort of a guess, or you, maybe it's like, you know, you have an intuition for it, but you got to pick one. Usually what you do is you just pick the simplest thing. And so I would, I would pick the, the original one just because it's simpler. You know, I don't have to do that adding angular momentum trick to it. It's the simpler one. <clears throat> so let's just, let's just pick the simpler one. That's good. That's exactly what you said. And so, but the question is, so let's pick that one, psi, n, l, m sub l, m sub s. Let's pick that one. But now we got to ask the question, is it a good basis? And so let's consider the quantum numbers that enumerate the degenerate subspace. So l comes from what operator? Tell me, what operator? L squared. M sub L comes from what operator? LZ. M sub S comes from what operator? SZ. That's right. So these are the operators whose eigenstates enumerate the index those states. So in other words, the degenerate manifold is non-degenerate in these operators, you know, because every state has a has a unique name in terms of L, M sub L, M sub S. Okay, so I got the operators that enumerate the degenerate subspace. And so now to see if it's a good basis, I got to take those operators and I got to see if they commute with what? Tell me. You know when I make this face, you know who I'm, I'm imitating? I'm imitating Mr. Bill. Actually, not Mr. Bill, but it's like, do you guys remember on Saturday Night Live, the little, the little plastic, the little claymation figure who goes, oh, no, it's Mr. Bill. Do you guys remember that? Does any of you remember that? Does, do any of you know what I'm talking about? Come on, somebody speak no. up. <laughs> That's so terrible. Okay, well, I want you all to Google it. Mr. Bill. There's a little claymation figure when the big, bad Mr. Bill would come, he, the little claymation figure would go, Oh no, it's Mr. Bill. And then he would get crushed and stomped by Mr. Bill. And that, and so when I do this, I'm thinking to myself, oh no, it's Mr. Bill in my own head, just so that you would know. Uh, go Google that so you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, so, um, all right. So we have to figure out the commutator of these operators with who? With what operator? To figure out if this is a good basis. The uh, uh, um Hamiltonian. That's exactly right. H prime. That's the trick. That's our new trick. And we got to see for this to be a good basis, then we need that commutator to be equal to what? Zero. Yes, this is what we want. We desperately want that 
to have a good basis. That's the trick that we did last time, to have a good basis. That trick, you know, when you're first learning this trick, it seems a little complicated, you know, but it's actually really simple. You just find the operators that enumerate your degenerate subspace and you see if they commute with the perturbation or not. So the trick is actually quite simple, but when you're learning it for the first time, it, there's a lot, of, a lot of moving parts and it seems really confusing, but it's actually sort of simple to do. So we just got to do, so that means that we have to do three commutators. Um, <clears throat> we'll do the first one. L squared, uh, H prime, and H prime is going to be, um, uh, it's going to be, uh, L, I'm going to forget about the fact, the, the, the prefactor, uh, but it'll be LZ plus 2SZ, right? Um, and this is the Zeeman term. And then we got to do the next one, which is going to be LZ comma LZ plus 2SZ. And then we got to do the third one, which is um, um, SZ with LZ plus 2SZ. Now let's look at these commutators. And if you look at them for a second, you'll see that that first one is equal to what? This one is equal to what? Zero. That's right. And this one is equal to what? Zero. That's right. And this one is equal to what? Also zero. That's right. And so therefore, that means that psi n l m sub l m sub s is a what basis? Good. Yes. Yay, it's a good basis. That's beautiful. So we did, so our trick tells us that that's a good basis. So that means that we can use the simple formula. So that means that delta E sub N, we can use the simple formula is equal to psi N L M sub L M sub S <coughs> H prime <coughs> um, psi N sub L M sub L M sub S. That means we can do that. And it's really easy because now we just do this. We just plug in the basis and we have R N L uh, and then we have a uh, um, L M sub L S M sub S and H prime is equal to what is it E B over two M? It's going to be E B over two M um, L Z plus two S Z, and then we have here S M sub S uh, L M sub L and R N L. And this becomes really easy because when this SZ hits this guy, what does SZ turn into? Somebody tell me. H bar M sub S. Exactly. And when this guy hits this guy, what does LZ turn into? Somebody tell me. H bar M sub L. Exactly, H bar M sub L. And so now, and then, though, and then the, this, just, this stuff is now just all a constant, and I can pull it out into the front, and then all the bras and cats just crash together and turn into big, a big fat one. And so then I see that delta E is gonna, is gonna be equal to uh, E B over two M, where M is the mass, <clears throat> times um, H bar M sub L, plus two H bar um, M sub S. And that's it. And so we see that the Zeeman formula depends in the strong field of Zeeman M sub L and M sub S. And so that's the answer. And so if I take my degenerate manifold, degenerate states, then in the strong field regime, <clears throat> it's gonna split it um, like crazy. My degenerate states are here for the for my n state, all my degenerate manifold, and it's going to split it like because th this state is degenerate in L m sub l. It's degenerate in L m sub l m sub s, and it's just going to split it like crazy. 
So every state that has a different value of, of this, uh, these are all the different values of M sub L plus two M sub S. And you're gonna, they, each one is gonna give you a different level. You see, that's the splitting. Splits like crazy. <clears throat> and so that's what the old, that's what the old timers saw a hundred years ago. They turned the knob all the way to the right into the strong field regime and they saw splitting. They could see it, you know, they shine light through it and they could see the, the, the spectra, which, which frequencies were absorbed. And they saw, oh my God, there's like crazy splitting. They saw that. Um, and so, and they, they were freaked out by that. And they're like, wow, that's, that's cool. Uh, but they couldn't explain it. Uh, and so now let's go to the next regime. Next regime, which is the next easy one, which is the uh, weak field regime, weak field. And so for the weak field, um, what we have is um, is this. We have now, we, we have, that uh, um, we have H equals H naught plus H prime, where that's the Zeeman effect. Uh, and now we have um, H naught is, uh, is equal to kinetic energy of the electron plus potential energy plus fine structure. But now we have H prime is way less smaller than the fine structure. And so now uh, what we will do is um, we have to then, what we do is we say, okay, well now what we want to do is we want to say, we, we always want to use our very, well, the question here is what is the splitting, okay? What is the splitting in the weak field regime? And so to find the splitting, we always want to use perturbation theory. And so we want to do this, delta E is equal to psi naught N H prime psi naught N. But the question is always, which basis? We gotta have a good basis. And so, um, well, actually we don't even have a choice this time. I will just ask you, this is this, is always for perturbation theory, this is always the unperturbed states. And so what are what are the unperturbed states in this case? Somebody tell me. We have to use the states that are for the fine structure. And what, what do we call those states? They haven't what do you, what would you call them? Uh I would label them by the like N, uh, L, J, and M, J. Exactly. And sometimes for shorthand, people would just call them the J states. Just because when you say J states, it's sort of like you, to get J, you need to add L and S. So it's just shorthand. So you'd say the J states. So the unperturbed states, we got to use those J states. And just it's exactly what you just said. So it'll be psi N, L, J, M, J because now we cannot ignore the fine structure. So the fine structure is in there. So the fine structure has already split the J states. Uh, and so we have psi NL. So we got to use these guys. So that's what we got to use. And so, but, but now the question is, so let's just sort of do this a little quicker than before. So now we can just ask, what, what is the critical question we have to ask bef before we can do the calculation, before we can plug into the simple formula we have to ask a question. What's the question? What is the question? Yeah? Is this basis good? Exactly. Is it a good basis? That's exactly right. And we'll go through the same reasoning as before. To figure out if it's a good basis, what we got to do is we got to look to see what are the quantum numbers that are indexing the degenerate subspace. And they are right here in, this la in these labels. L is what operator? L refers to what operator? L squared. Good. J refers to what operator? J 
squared. MJ refers to what operator? KZ. Yes. So that means we got to find the commutator of, I just want to do it the same way I did before. How did I do it before? Yeah. We got to find the commutator of these guys with another operator. And what's, what operator goes here? What operator goes right here where I have the star? Tell me. Is it the same one as before, the Zeman? Yeah. Uh, exactly. Yes, to see if something is a good basis, you look at the operators that enumerate the degenerate subspace, which are these guys, and you ask, do they commute with the perturbation? If they do, then it's a good basis. That is the trick that we did last time. That was that weird little theorem that we proved, that little math theorem or linear algebra theorem. Okay, so we got to do it. And so we got to do that same thing as before. So let's do it. So we have, um, <clears throat> ah, but there's a, <laughs> there's a trick. I got to, uh, I actually have to do a trick because <clears throat> there, there is a trick. I mean, check this out. Fine structure. Okay, there is a trick here. The fine structure does this. The fine structure took all of our degenerate states and it split them. Remember? It split them into j1 j2 j3 the fine structure split the j's so when we are in the degenerate subspace does it, do we have it, so the question is in degenerate subspace of the fine structure Hamiltonian, then is it degenerate in J? That's a question I'm asking you. So there, there is a subtlety here. Is our degenerate subspace degenerate in J? Does J index the degenerate subspace? In other words, are there more than one, are there multiple J's in the degenerate subspace? See, each of these is a degenerate subspace. Degenerate, degenerate, degenerate. But if I pick one degenerate subspace, is, are there multiple values of J living in a degenerate subspace? That's my question. Are there? Yes or no? I'm gonna say no. <clears throat> And, and can you explain why? That's the correct answer. Can you explain why? Because they, they already split, right? Yes, exactly. HFS, the fine structure, already split the J's. And so this is a subtlety, but it's important. So when I go back here and I ask the question, is it a good basis? Do I have to take, do I have to worry about J squared? Do I stick J squared into there? Yes or no? Do I, do I worry about J squared? No. That's right. I don't. Because, because the degenerate subspace is not degenerate in J squared. I only worry about L squared and, J, and JZ. And that's actually really important. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's really important. So the commutators that we need to find out are these ones. I go back here and I do, I have L squared and JZ. So I have L squared and then I have uh, JZ and I have to see if they commute with the uh, uh, Zeman guy. LZ plus 2SZ, do they? 
And so if I look at this first guy, what is this commutator equal to? Can you look at that and tell me the answer? Zero. Yes. And how about this guy? This one's not quite as obvious, but um, what do you think it is? Isn't it also zero? Yes, that's exactly right. Good. So that means, therefore, psi uh, n l j m sub j is a good basis. For weak field Zeeman, and so that means then that that the the change in energy delta E n is just going to be this psi n l j m j uh, Zeeman, which is E b over two m times. Um, Lz plus 2Sz uh, psi nlj mj. <clears throat> okay, so now I can just plug in. And this part is a little, not too hard, but it's a little harder than before. But let's plug it in. Our nl, that's the radial part. Then we have the, the jmj part. And now we have the eb over 2m lz plus 2Sz. Um, uh, let's do this, J, M, J, uh, R, N, L. Okay, so now we just have to calculate that. And let's just do a little trick. We'll, we'll just do the little trick. We'll say that L, Z plus 2, S, Z is equal to J, Z plus S, Z. Do you see that? Okay, that's that's a little trick, but it's like an easy little trick since JZ is equal to LZ plus SZ. So that means, so this thing is equal to JZ plus SZ. And so now when JZ hits this, what does JZ equal? It turns into what? MJ H bar. Exactly, H bar MJ. So that means that this becomes really easy, or part of it becomes easy. We see that the delta E <coughs> becomes, um, let's see, where did it all go? Um, it becomes um, E B over 2 M times, and that part becomes really simple. It just becomes H bar M J, but I still have this other part plus now the radial part just goes away because there's no radial dependence. So that just turns into, goes crashing into a, a one, but we still have J, M, J, um, S, Z, uh, J, M, J. Okay, so that's what the formula falls down to. But now this is actually kind of complicated, uh, this one, um, because this is, this, these are not eigenstates of each other. This is not an eigenstate of S Z. So to calculate this, we have to then expand uh, J M J into its constituent components. And remember, if we're it's a change of basis, and we we constructed J M J from the product states. And so the product states we constructed it using the um, where did I write that? Uh, we from the using the Klebsch Gordon coefficients. So this thing is equal to a bunch, there's a bunch of stuff in there. It's a sum over um, M sub L and M sub S of the product states, uh, L M sub L times S um, M sub S. So those are the product states and we have the klebsch gordon coefficients and those depend on J and L and S and MJ, and this is a sum over M sub L and M sub S, and it's a restricted sum because I know that M sub L plus M sub S has to equal what? Do you remember? M sub J. Exactly. And so this is what these states look like. These states are equal to this mess, 
And so basically we gotta, we gotta plug this mess into there. But once we do that, then you can see how we can find the answer. Because now when S sub Z hits this ugly mess, it's going to be, we know what to do because when SZ hits this guy, then it's going to turn into an H bar M sub S. But I got this sum. So it's sort of a little bit of a complicated sum, but you can do it. But we're not going to go through all the details. But I just wanted to mention to you how you would do it. And when you go through all the details, then you, you get a, a cute little formula pops out. And that little formula is um, E B times H bar. <clears throat> over two times the mass times m sub j times one plus or minus one over two l plus or minus one where uh, j is equal to l plus or minus one half so it's a funny little formula it depends on which j you you use so oh shit damn it i went to some weird mode God. I do not know how to get out of this mode. Shit. Uh, oh, there, I got out of it. God, I hate this thing. Um, okay, so then we have um, this. Uh, Okay, so that's the answer. And so we can then see that um, this thing, this formula, if we just look at that formula, we see that it splits. And because we're running out of time, it splits the uh, JZ uh, degeneracy. Um, it splits the JZ and, uh, and the L squared degeneracy. because JZ is the H bar MJ and L squared is the different Ls. So you can see that, that uh, this weak field uh, splits that degeneracy. And so for the weak field, the picture that you should have in your mind is that I have my degenerate states for some N manifold. They split already into the different J states, right? This is J1. J2, J3, but now there's some splitting here. This is the picture you should have in your mind. These guys split like this. There's some additional splitting, and these guys are the MJs and the uh, Ls split. So that's what happens in the weak field. You already have the big splitting of the Js, and then you get the little, so it's sort of like, the big split plus the little splitting. And, and that's what the old timers saw 100 years ago. They saw the big splitting and then they got little tiny splits. And that's very different from the uh, strong field. So here's the strong field, strong. And the strong field they saw just went boom, it just split like crazy. But then for the weak field, they saw just little itty bitty baby splitting on the, on the edge of those J's. So, so this was what they saw for the weak field. Okay, so I guess that's where, we're, where we will stop. And the, the, the only one we did not do is the intermediate field, which is kind of a mess and we can't really do it anyways, but we'll, we'll do that one. Uh, we'll talk about that one later. I'll, I'll just say for the intermediate field, then, there's, then you have to... Uh, Basically, you have to diagonalize H prime in the degenerate subspace, degenerate subspace. There's, there's no good basis. No good basis. You have to find the good basis. You have to calculate. You have to, you have to calculate the good basis. You have to find it yourself. By, di by diagonalizing H prime in the degenerate subspace. That's what you do for the intermediate case. That's why it's so hard. Okay, folks, bye-bye.